Hello, and welcome to Broadband Technology Reports 4K for You. How to Prepare for Ultra HD Video, sponsored by Verimatrix. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, which I guess is probably about all of you, uh, I'm Ron Hendrickson, BTR's Managing Editor. I'm moderating the uh, Hangout today. With us today are David Price, Vice President of the Ultra HD Forum, Mark Francisco, fellow Comcast Innovation Labs, and Steve Christian, Senior Vice President of Marketing for Verimatrix. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank all of our distinguished speakers and also Verimatrix for making this event possible. Uh, today we're going to look at Ultra HD video, specifically with a focus on how to prepare to deploy it. Uh, so uh, we'll start out with the state of Ultra HD today, then move into uh, service provider experiences and lessons learned, and then we're going to get into some of the nitties and gritties, actual nuts and bolts of actual deployment, um, video security in particular being an area of focus. You can uh, submit questions for our experts at any time via Twitter using the hashtag BTR4K. That's Bravo Tango Romeo 4 Kilo. We'll uh, gather questions throughout the presentation and uh, answer as many of them as possible in a Q&A session at the end. Okay, uh, so let's kind of get this started. Oh, and by the way, if uh, you've not already done so, please email your colleagues, uh, your parents, your friends and family. Tell them to come on over here. This is going to be pretty cool. Okay, so the um, state of Ultra HD today. Um, we've been seeing more and more deployments. Uh, more and more 4K sets are becoming available. People are buying them. Um, uh, more and more content is becoming available, um, so definitely things are beginning to ramp up. Um, David, uh, could you uh, please paint us a little bit more detailed picture about uh, where you guys see uh, Ultra HD today? Yeah, um, both with my Ericsson and Ultra HD forum hats on, we've seen a growing level of um, awareness that Ultra HD is, is much, much more than 4K. It's, um, it is um, a combination of uh, the uh, combination of the, uh, the, the, the wider color gamut that's now available, the, um, the, the, uh, the new electro optical transfer function that can deliver the higher uh, levels of color and high levels of voluminance uh, through a high dynamic range, all those things coming together. So, the yes, there has been an amazing amount of 4K sets sold, but this year you'll see a lot more which are claiming either uh, through the logo program that our uh, affiliate kind of organization, if you like, the UHD Alliance has put out uh, the Ultra HD Premium logos, which are basically in two forms, one that suits OLEDs, one that suits the conventional LED LCD um, displays. And, uh, and also, uh, you'll just see a lot of uh, proprietary names for this enhanced viewing experience, which is the, uh, really enabled by a high dynamic range. So I'm happy to share with you a list of the operators that, and that are T testing it out right now. Would you like me to share that with you? Yeah, that'd be great. Let me uh, just put a, a map of the world up real quick. And you can see a lot of these are driven by what I would call IP unicast, uh, aka OTT kind of operings around the world. But it's, it's really widespread now. And this is just a snapshot that we try to maintain at the Ultra HD forum. Um, and just uh, just just uh, as recently as last week, I, you, know, you guys informed me about the NOS uh, deployment in Portugal, but it's constantly updating, and we'll need to go to smaller fonts on that pretty soon. So it, it is gathering momentum. Whether this is just 4K in this first phase, or whether it's going to include 
HDR especially is going to be an interesting thing that maps out over the next 12 to 18 months, we think. We, think. Uh, we do believe that the full range the, uh, the we have available, all, all the tool sets, is not going to be this year. The, the uh, Ultra HD Forum released some guidelines that uh, describe what we can do this year. And, and uh, the, we're going on from there to, to actually produce another set of guidelines for what we expect in 2017. But HDR plays a big role in it. And in fact, we're just in the middle of a survey that will be really interesting to release sometime between now and, and um, the uh, IBC show, which actually asks people around the world to rank the relative importance of all the factors, the wide color gamut, high frame rate, next generation audio, etc., etc., all the way through HDR and, of course, 4K spatial resolution. So that's going to be an interesting thing, but already from the initial results, we're seeing uh, that HDR has more bang for the buck, if you like, than the 4K. And we'll come on to some later on, I guess. I hope we can actually describe some of the challenges to get the full immersive experience out there next year. Okay, so um, HDR, I haven't seen... Um a lot of HDR sets out yet. I don't recall seeing any at NAB, but that doesn't mean they weren't there. Yeah, um, we, we actually have seen um, some good good uh, screens now. LG's got some great screens, which are, oh, okay. they're, they're really focused on OLED uh, technology, and it looks absolutely stunning, especially in a darkened room environment. And also Sony now have got some great uh, screens that are out there at you know, 1,000 nits, and more. It's uh, that, you know that the whole thing about uh, brightness and ambient light thing is still an issue. Uh, that uh, just as recently as last week in Italy, we were we had a big debate about it. But anyway, that's that's it's, it's coming now. It definitely is coming. HDR is definitely marching into the living room. Okay. Uh, have you been to uh, the the Cable Labs Innovation or not the uh, Innovation Labs? They're uh, your advanced video lab up in Louisville, Colorado? I haven't personally, but I know our people, of course, have. Yes, okay. and we're very, uh, we're very involved with all those kind of things. And uh, we, we have innovation um, going, as you probably heard, uh, with uh, Fox um, Studios. We're uh, working with Fox and uh, trying to uh, you know, work with them and others, other partners in that innovation lab to, to see how, how the best deployments can be for this next generation user experience. Personally, you know, I, I'm holding off buying a, a set just yet, but it's coming soon. I keep on warning my wife that uh, she needs to watch out. We may change the, uh, the the topology of the living room. Okay, there you go. Uh, the, yeah, the HDR, um, the, what's interesting, I guess, about HDR is um, you're still getting a really very, very nice picture, um, but uh, you don't have the big, well, as big a bandwidth tariff as you do with 4K Ultra HD. Um, can you address that a little bit, please? Yeah, yeah. I mean, 4K comes with four times the bandwidth the tariff. Not, you can yeah. reduce that, obviously, by going to HEVC. Still some question marks over HEVC with you no know, licensing, perhaps, and... We haven't seen the industry get the full performance out of it just yet, but it's uh, making great strides. And um, we're working, you know, back with my Ericsson hat on, we're working very hard to, you know, to make sure that is optimized for the market. Because it is a challenge, four times bandwidth for, for, for delivering this, which doesn't give you as much bang for the buck as an HDR does and wide color gamut. So just by putting a wider color gamut and a higher dynamic range is marginal in terms of what it loads the bandwidth. It's going to make a, it's going to make a, you know people with caps or or a, you know, pay by the uh, by the bit. They're going to make be much happier receiving a, a 1080p with HDR and wide color gamut than they are um, with a 4K only solution. So we see it coming uh, pretty soon. You know, a 1080p version with HDR um, because of those reasons. So David, you're really talking here about the the compelling user experience that that will really uh, you know create a premium service level, right? Correct, exactly. 
And that's what some people want. They want the next wow factor. Do you remember it going from SD to HD? It was pretty darn good. And pretty soon, I'm sure you're like me, you never watch anything in SD, right? It's a horrible experience. Yeah. It is, exactly. So it's the FM AM transition. And we're going to do the same kind of level of transition if we get it right with high dynamic range and wider color gamut. Okay, and if I'm remembering correctly, the uh, the, the bandwidth difference or uh, with HDR is HD plus what about ten percent, fifteen percent? Does that sound right? If that exactly, exactly. Okay, okay very good. Um, let's see. We should probably move over here to Mark real fast. Um, Mark now. Uh, Comcast introduced Ultra HD in 2014, if I remember correctly, right. and um, also introduced its own 4K set-top last year. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about those experiences, uh, lessons learned, what kind of planning you had to do ahead of time, things like that? Yeah, sure. Uh, so Comcast ha uh, launched in 2014 and maintains a uh, an Ultra HD we call it a sampler application, which gives um, deep levels of a series of several um, assets. So we're working with a number of different networks, and we provide their entire uh, seasons of content, several of them. So it's, it's fairly deep. Uh, it's, an, it's a narrow library of content today uh, as we're watching the whole for demand for 4K uh, evolve. I would say the experience, first of all, has been uh, relatively easy on the network. Uh, we moved over to compression through HEVC. Um, you know, there's a lot about video quality. Resolution is only one factor. We talk about dynamic range and color. And compression efficiency and workflow are probably as important as the other uh, that I mentioned. And one of the big changes was going to what we call as a unified workflow, which gets closer to master quality content from the content suppliers. And then you do a single generation compression in HEVC. So if you start with a high quality mezzanine file and move it very quickly to a distribution ready dozen megabit or so HEVC, 4K yields are very good. So you're saying for approximately at or less than traditional HD bit rates, you're getting 4K. Um, to date, all of our content distributed has been 24 frame per second. Um, cooling is occurring for 60 frame per second for sporting events. Um, that has its own set of challenges and really it's been less about the network. Um, it's been more about how do I get an efficient end-to-end -end content delivery ecosystem going. Right When you get into sports, it's considered like really where uh, a lot of the challenge in new formats is, both 4K and HDR alike. Uh, Sports cameras are ENG, uh, electronic news gathering, uh, which means they are display referred, and the vast majority of sports cameras are shooting 720p60 or 1080i, 30 frames per second or 60 fields per second, um, are not 4K. Uh, mm -hmm. There's concerns when you go to a 4K sensor, you get a narrower depth of field, which challenges sports, and you have 12 gigabit per second interfaces to the cameras that have to be uh, accommodated. And a lot has occurred there, and a lot of the you know, so at NEB this year, last year, each year you see tremendous evolution of the content creation side of things to the point now you have a single switcher unit that can pass through uh, a 4K P60. Uh, I use 4K interchangeably. It's really Ultra HD 2160 by 3840 is really the format I'm referring to, but one at sports frame rates, and the sports cameras are starting to adapt to ENG lenses. Um, and also this idea of dual ended workflows, the idea that I can produce uh, off a 4K image sensor uh, content that would be readily adapted to HD, some SD, and 4K all the same. The, the new frontier of challenge is doing the same thing for HDR. And uh, I have strong sense of confidence that the idea of doing a single ended sports capture an HDR 4K that can deliver to HD, HDR, HD, and SD, and 4K, SDR, all the, all, all the same. To so adapt to all, the variety of different generations of TVs that bring, people bring into their homes. 
you know, there's over 100 million SD TVs still in American homes. Um, there's equivalent in HD. There's a smaller number, but growing rapidly in 4K. And there's an even smaller number, but also growing rapidly in HDR. Um, my understanding is some brands of televisions, their entire 4K lineups are HDR capable now. Oh, fun. Yeah, so it's it's kind of getting easier to get uh, HDR capability. And I don't think these things are orthogonal. HDR is a wonderful complement. White color gamut is a wonderful complement. Um, I'm a bit of an audio fan, so I really think um, object-based, spatial audio, multi-channel audio, anything we can move audio frontiers forward. Um, very small incremental bandwidth required for these, uh, but provide a tremendous boost in experience. So okay. I have talked around a bunch of things, but I hope I provide a little bit of the background where things are. Yeah, now, now, one thing uh, that you mentioned that uh, maybe we don't talk about enough in, in the trade press is that um, 4K is, in fact, uh, Ultra HD. There's also 8K and all the other things. Sure. Um, but, um, but 4K is uh, really kind of an end-to-end -end thing. You're talking about at the content production end and all the way through the delivery chain. You've got to have the Ultra HD capable cameras, um, you know, all the video processing, and an actual uh, 4K capable uh, uh, display unit. Um, uh, Steve, can you, uh, can you address that just a little bit? Uh, clearly, yeah. I mean, the, uh, there is a, it is an end-to-end -end value proposition, uh, you know, and significantly more uh, preparation and investment and, and changes, I'm guessing, for things like live content than uh, perhaps for uh, movie-type content, um, simply because, you know, the, the, the resolution of cinema, for instance, has been uh, 4K, slightly different standard, but 4K resolution for, for some while for digital cinema projection and so on. So um, that, that probably eases the, the transition a little bit for that, um, you know, on-demand type type content. But what, what we've been anxious to do is to uh, prepare our customers and particularly our partners to make sure that they have the ability to introduce these new services, the new experience that we think uh, commands the premium uh, value proposition, to introduce those um, in a relatively organic fashion uh, in their set-top box devices, for instance, um, and uh, prepare their customers to uh, uh, put the right TVs in place for the watching experience, for instance. And of course, with all of that investment, uh, the, the important thing is to be able to make sure that um, that investment's protected in an appropriate fashion from the operator's point of view. And uh, that's that's the, the raison d'etre of, uh, of Verimatrix, is to, uh, to make sure that, that this premium Premium value proposition um, is uh, maintainable and, and you know is a is a significant uh, boost to the competitiveness and the revenue uh, potential of uh, pay TV operators around the world. Um, we've we've got some early successes. That some that are public, uh, some that are still coming on. Um, but in each case, you know, it's a it's 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 a um, a, a longish kind of progression of, of, of the the value chain from preparing the the, the chip uh, devices giving them a sort of certification process for ultra security to make sure those are built into receptor box devices um, or TVs for instance and then making sure that the uh, the overall end-to-end -end security uh, mechanisms work on top of the content uh, that is um, being delivered. Okay, very good. Um, Mark, I'd like to come back to you real quickly. Uh, based on your experience with 4K deployment, um, what advice would you offer to uh, another cable operator who wants to get into delivering 4K? What are kind of the essential uh, Planning moves, starting steps. You know, where does a fellow even begin if he wants to launch 4K? Yeah. So, first of all, I, I think the uh, there's a lot of the bespoke 
uh, solutions for delivery of 4K, and they're, you know, I say it's not scary in terms of uh, network readiness. The cable industry is you know, fond of its DOCSIS networks, and they're, they're quite well suited for 4K uh, delivery. Uh, the piece of it, and I, I think it was touching on it a little bit earlier, is um, 4K is a wonderful, you know, very recognizable uh, brand you know, or name, uh, but it has a, a brand promise, and that's going to only be brought about if we care for the content every step of the way. And you have to really look at your content workflow and say, is it ready to provide the 4K value proposition? We could discuss how close you need to sit to the TVs and the size of the televisions in your living room, but the fact is there are people that can see the difference with 4K content uh, because they have the right environments for it. And to, to realize that um, doesn't mean just throwing bandwidth at it, but it does mean to, have, uh, to take care of the way you um, handle your content from point A to point B. Great advantage is there's a number of suppliers Nowadays, it can help you in endeavors uh, such as this that have a lot of expertise. Many come from very close to Hollywood, so they understand what it's like to create a studio master, understand how to preserve a lot of that quality as, as, uh, as you bring it all the way through. So I would suggest that's the first. And the second is there are uh, some wonderful new standards uh, where we participate in the Ultra HD Forum. Um, we work closely with uh, our sister brother companies, NBC and Universal Studios, who are active in the um, Ultra HD Alliance. And um, they're developing best practices, which can be used to help you to do the best job possible with Ultra HD and HDR, for that matter. Um, and to follow their guidance is going to give you just a better overall product that has the widest range of uh, addressability. We started with smart televisions, we're following up with uh, set-top boxes, but doing so in a fashion that we can use a common delivery method. We're using MPEG Dash, uh, we're using high quality but widely available digital rights management um, structures. We're rooting those in uh, trusted execution environments or trusted computing modules to ensure the integrity to allow the highest value content to pass through possible. Uh, but again, those are things that are rel relatively easily available uh, and relatively easy to, uh, to integrate to. So you're starting to do 4K mostly from an apps development perspective. And even at that, the apps are developed as HTML pages. So it's, it's, if you get into the modern sort of Internet age of delivery of things, 4K can be a little bit easier. Sure, sure. Um, it, it does seem like um, IP delivery is... Uh, kind of the easier way to do it. Does that sound right? I, I would say that there's more mass of development around IP delivery. Okay. And actually doesn't mean necessarily, I know folks talk about OTT like it's a pejorative term, but when you think of OTT <laughs> as an IP style delivery, exactly, it's not bad. Um, <laughs> IP style delivery is, it just makes sense because uh, 4K being relatively high bandwidth and these fragmented and segmented methods of delivery are really best at getting high quality isochronous content through lossy media. And that's fundamentally what we're trying to do here. Right, right. Right. Okay. Uh, Can I ask a question, Ron, about yeah, that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, clearly, uh, some of AVR technologies, I think you're mentioning, Mark, um, yeah. are pretty good for, for on demand content. Do you think there's some reservations about? ABR use for uh, for linear live content, sports, and so on and so forth, because some of the latency issues involved. There seems to there may be a an argument to say that um, multicast or, or broadcast technologies may still have a big role to play in that kind of content delivery. Yeah, although interesting enough, multicast is an IP technology, so of course, I, yeah. yeah, and ABR does not necessarily mean that it's lowest common denominator. ABR just gives you the ability to tolerate a wider range of network uh, conditions. Um, and quality of experience, uh, yeah, I suggest most of that is allowing that shifting between HD and Ultra HD, uh, which can be done with uh, pretty low latency. Uh, you got to watch you know, with your choice of um, HTTP delivery systems uh, that they don't 
accommodate too much buffering. Uh, but most of the programmable video pipelines allow that to be uh, minimized because everybody fears that the, the the apartment upstairs is going to hear the, the the soccer goal before you do because you've got a 10 second <laughs> fragment or segment delay. Um, but there's a lot of optimization that's available uh, nowadays, and you know with Moore's law or whatever your favorite uh, you know, law of physics in terms of how much more powerful encoding platforms are. That also reduces latency, and fiber deeper also reduces latency, and, and some things. Like that. An interesting area of uh, optimization for sure. Then. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, now, now we're we're talking about adaptive bitrate and OTT delivery, things like this. Um, if if you're a bandwidth constrained operator, um, say God help you, you're a broadcaster or uh, uh, say a mobile operator where your bandwidth is very very limited. Um, does it make sense for those guys to uh, go to a, uh, an OTT or streaming model for 4K? Uh, David, I think you're probably best guy to answer this one. Yeah, the um, it's it's still developing. People are kind of experimenting in different ways now with this. It's um, you know, one of the things that uh, is clear that it's easy, the kind of the, the cost of entry as um, an IP delivered over unmanaged networks is very, very, very low comparatively to a broadcaster. So that's why we're seeing a lot of a lot of this. And the the and by the way, I have to make a point about the Ultra HD forum, and that, that's the reason it exists. As and and Comcast is one of the founders, as was Ericsson. Um, the the idea of just certifying the content and certifying the screen, there's a big gap in the middle, and that's that's really what we're focused on is the whole workflow, as, as Mark was saying, and we actually did some interop testing um, just around the, the last ATSC um, meeting in Washington, and it went all the way from the camera, and and it needs to include all the different delivery models. Um, ABR, VBR, CBR, etc. But uh, because they're all going to be parts of the monetization of content, so it needs to be an end-to-end -end solution uh, that has been well thought through, and uh, that includes rights management and it includes um, ad insertion. Uh, it, it's uh, it's going to be interesting when we see uh, SDR ads, for instance, being mixed in with HDR content. What's going to happen there? How is it going to be? Up and down converted. What happens when you go from a, a, in a say a live soccer game, which is being broadcast in 4K with HDR, and you want to go to the last World Cup, which was clearly just a 1080p event? And what's it going to look like when we mix that content? That's one of the eight challenges that uh, we've identified. That and how do we handle that without really upsetting the user experience? So that's still to come, and we've got to work this through as an industry. Yeah, uh, David, uh, you just mentioned the eight challenges. I don't think we've seen that uh, slide yet, have we? Uh, no, but I can. I'm happy to put it up. Let yeah, me, exactly. let me uh, see if I can do that right now. That's the the one on uh, on the deployments. This is the eight key challenges that we see. So, Mark just mentioned about screen size, viewing distance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Another one is very important: is ambient lights. Um, lighting. Um, what in normal circumstances is it really a wow to like it was going from SD to HD? And do we need an even higher uh, Ultra HD Premium Plus, if you like, that goes beyond a thousand nits? You know, people are like Dolby, again a founder of, uh, of the Ultra HD forum, of of been uh, preaching the, the value of four thousand nits and even beyond, and demonstrating beyond that as well. So. Is, is that what it's going to take? And by the way, when you do that, there is a serious concern about power consumption. If everybody starts having you know, 4,000 nit screens in their home, what's it going to do to electric bills and just the ability to, to handle you know, the 38 hours per week of viewing of that is going to be pretty significant. Bandwidth constraints and caps, will it restrict Ultra HD? Certainly with the 4K you know, caveat that we did just now. And then we've got this whole idea of the uh, the electro optical transfer functions. We've got two right now, really of any note: HLG, which is the BBC NHK, and the PQ, which is the 
out of SIMT 2084. And you know, can the market handle both those? Is there going to be a nice, easy way to signal, just like you can with 16 by 9 versus 4 by 3? Can we signal to make sure that the right transfer function is in the is in the decoding device? And is there any form of backward compatibility that's going to work? HLG has some promise of that, but um, we've, you know, still we want to see that if it can be really um, you know, put out in mass. Licensing issues, I talked about HEBC concerns. And then that last one we talked about, last two bullets here are the mixed content. HDR and SDR mixed content and 709 and 2020 color gamut mixed content. Interesting challenges. Are there, are there, is the smarts going to be in the network to overcome those kind of mixed content, or is it going to have to be up to an increasingly smart consumer device? So that's what we see today as the as the eight challenges. Okay, sure. Um, the licensing in particular is uh, is kind of a sticky thing in that. Um, seems like Hollywood is getting more, well, not just Hollywood, content producers generally, uh, seem to be getting fussier and fussier about um, uh, how the uh, content is protected, watermarking, uh, DRM, encryption, all these kinds of things. And that kind of gets us into uh, some of the nitties and gritties that we mentioned earlier. Um, uh, Steve, can you... Uh, can you paint that picture for us a little bit? What are you seeing uh, coming from the content producer side? Yeah, of course. Um, one of the early sort of statements about this kind of um, realm came from Movie Labs, an organization of the of the studios. Um, they put out some uh, guidelines for enhanced content protection, which included a number of kind of principles that we have used as uh, a guiding uh, framework to create our security product for UHD um, service delivery, uh, our, our product called VCAS Ultra, in fact, which we introduced uh, last year. The, um, the, the key sort of founding principles that, that, that uh, really, where the rubber meets the road, uh, are, are largely in client devices. Um, and we call them sort of three pillars of content security for, for ultra, um, uh, for UHD premium services. And they're sort of combinations of hardware and software techniques that exist in the client device. They really are, you know, hardware routing of uh, trust chain, um, the ability to protect execution of some critical code segments for, for management of keys, and the ability to use forensic watermarking on the uh, uh, display. Um, all those three things combine to provide the sort of framework of, of UHD service delivery. And importantly, I think uh, it sort of combine to um, enable the real leap forward that Movie Labs alluded to, which is uh, the renewability or, uh, of, of security. It's important to be able to detect where uh, the security is broken down in a particular device, a particular type of content, for instance, to be able to respond to that and renew the security domain so you can keep up to date. Previous security regimes associated with, associated with HD, for instance, have been um, you know, shown to, uh, to fail over the course of time as, as the threat model changes. And one of the key things about uh, UHD is to try and keep the security boundary one step ahead of some of the uh, attacks that the, the new services will face. So that's what we've tried to do in, in the uh, ultra security regime and that's what we're rolling out with respect to our to our customer base where they're actually filing and, and, and launching UHD services at, at the present time to, to add all those kinds of components into their delivery chain. Okay. Um, another thing that we're seeing with uh, and, and we this was mentioned a little bit earlier uh, with Ultra HD video, uh, be it 4K or, or some other format, is that um, more often than not, this is pretty val uh, pretty high value content. Live sporting events, uh, soccer, football, um, uh, recent release movies. Um, so you know, you know, obviously that uh, carries a little bit different um, 
a little bit different security requirement than old episodes of, say, the honey, uh, the honey, honeymooners, something like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, that that is the point about uh, UHD services, right? As as David was alluding to, um, there's the wow factor associated with a, a step change in um, consumer enjoyment and consumer perceived quality, and we. Uh, very much subscribe to the notion that you know 4K alone enhanced resolution does not uh, achieve that for, for many, very many people. So it needs a combination of some of the other uh, elements of uh, high dynamic range and wider color gamut and potentially frame rate and so on and so forth to actually achieve that 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 wow factor and really um, make consumers actually want to leap into the world of, of UHD. Uh, services. I'll call them Ultra HD Premium Services because that's the kind of branding of the of the TV uh, that can actually reproduce these kinds of effects now. And we, so, so um, yes, there's a there's a there's a changing kind of world of of uh, premium services and a changing world of threats against those premium services. And that's the kind of nature of the beast that we are responding to as a security vendor. Is to be able to make sure that you can command a higher uh, premium value for some of these uh, live and on-demand type contents, and to be able to preserve that uh, as as the services grow and uh, mature uh, in the in the customer's mind. So that's that's really our that's really the the field of play is is to is to use this uh, technology as a as a business tool for operators to actually enhance their competitiveness and to be able to, uh, you know, gain some extra sort of revenue potential from their consumers. Okay, sure. Um, now, regarding premium services, uh, Mark, I'd like to come back to you on this one real quick. Um, how do you see uh, kind of the service mix shaking out? Uh, it, I can certainly see where, for example, you might have uh, if I'm a cable operator, I might have uh, the 4K content on a premium tier. Right? It might or might not be you know, something you would have in expanded basic, for example. Is that a realistic way to approach that? Um, I don't, so I have to be, I don't want to say careful here, but to say that programming decisions probably differ a bit from technology platforms in sure, sure. right they're they're based on market economics and consumer demand and all of those sort of things our approach thus far has been to deploy 4k um, as a if you already have content you've already subscribed to content from us be it your standard package or premium channels we will extend 4k versions of the same to you and that's our current methodology um, that's not to say over time there aren't opportunities for transactional premium content and whatnot, but for what Comcast does today is really based on your current subscriptions offers these um, premium experiences to you. Because uh, you've already taken a premium channel, here's the 4K versions of the assets. We, we have some stars assets, for example, now and, and some things from, from the various um, Universal and NBC networks. Okay, so very much then like uh, uh, you know, a free internet speed upgrade sort of a deal. You know, for example, I'm already getting this package. Uh, it used to only be 50 megabits per second. Now all of a sudden it's 75, and I didn't have to do anything. You know, that's you know, that's it's awesome. looking at adding convenience to uh, to your content packages. Just okay. as we offer you know multi-screen and mobile and web and television, if you consider a 4K or an HDR screen is another type of screen. You of course want your content all all of your screens. So the the real the fundamental design flow is to make sure that any piece of content, as long as we have the appropriate you know content security methods in and the rights to display it on those screens, should be available on all those screens. Okay. And, and we're saying like, elsewhere. I'm sorry. Ultra HD screens. Can get very large, but they're also going to get smaller over time as well as more mobile, web, tablet PCs are supporting 4K. Sorry, no, not there. 
no problem. I, I, I think what we're seeing sort of elsewhere in the world uh, as as our customers deploy these kinds of services is is the introduction of a new premium tier, right? It may be on a uh, uh, what you might call it like a freemium basis initially, just to get the interest level up. But but uh, premium tiers are, are, are the way forward for particularly for things like sporting events and so on, uh, which are used uh, right now to be able to sort of uh, pilot these programs and actually uh, you know get the first round of UHD subscribers in in place. So. Okay. Alrighty. Well, well and, and again, as, as Mark points out, it sounds like this is very much um, a business decision rather than a technology decision, yeah? Well, you have, you have to put the technology in place, right? And then the business opportunity, you can take advantage of the business opportunity. That's really the what I was saying earlier on about preparing the, the pipeline of, of uh, suppliers and technology components and things like that. And once all these things are in place, then you can... Uh, offer a service that can be switched on uh, on give, for a given consumer, and uh, potentially upsell them to this kind of new wow factor kind of uh, engagement. Okay. All right. There was something else I wanted to ask, and now I've forgotten what the heck it was. Darn it. Real quick. Uh, let's see. So well, what I should say is, you know, I'm commending that the the uh, uh, Ultra HD forum and and uh, our colleagues in in that forum were actually sort of putting together all these component trees and trying to answer all the key questions in order to be able to run um, UHD services for sure, but also to be able to keep um, you know compatibility and and lower consumer confusion and and shock factor. When you're trying to mix a range of offerings in the uh, in the consumer's mind, right? So when they change channels, when they go from uh, one, you know, from a, a UHD or ultra high definition um, uh, sports content, as David said, to uh, to advertising that may not be in that format yet. I can remember all the jarring transitions that used to happen in uh, in US broadcast of going down to SD video ads when you're looking at uh, high definition uh, broadcasts that was uh, very uh, I don't know a substandard experience so obviously there's a lot to get right in terms of the mixture of uh, business models and mixture of content that's available as you actually launch these services uh, in the consumer in the consumer world okay sure okay. well and what's what's really kind of fun about that is you know, the uh, the HD transition wasn't all that long ago uh, it, it's really fun to watch how quickly video technology is really moving. It's uh, it's actually a very exciting time right now. It is. It is an exciting time for all of us. And if it ain't fun, why do it? <laughs> okay. Um, we're actually getting uh, pretty close to the 45-minute mark on this. Uh, so probably we should uh, move into some viewer questions. We've got uh, a number of them here, I see. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, here's one. Uh, what makes UHD services compelling from a business standpoint? Uh, Steve, we've talked about that a little bit. Would you like to expand on that one? Well, I'll, I'll try and expand, but the basic... Uh, approach that that we believe is um, important is you know this uh, well we mentioned it before a, a, you know a wow factor so you, a consumer will actually appreciate the difference between something that is marketed as ultra uh, or ultra HD premium um, and something that is uh, you know normal run of the mill HD and um, you know. Enhanced resolution alone has been shown that that's uh, it's not it doesn't provide that compelling difference in most cases. Um, I, I saw a um, report of a Sky Italia, uh, I think, um, talking about that missed expectation of 4K yesterday. They were talking about delaying introduction of of their UHD services until they could properly put in place UHD and other um, enhancements. 
and that uh, uh, that that's kind of under underscores some of the the, the transitional um, challenges that, that that do exist, and potentially some of the mismarketing that went on with early early uh, 4K enhanced resolution only products, which we have to overcome uh, in the minds of consumers. So the bus the business proposition is really you know, enhanced ARPU for operators, um, potentially, you know, better revenues for, for the content owners as well, but uh, as that flows through. But that's that's really the uh, that's really the ra rationale. And of course, um, it, it becomes a more competitive value proposition for operators who can deliver the higher bandwidths and the higher the uh, the higher um, quality content sources that. Um, that they can offer versus, you know, competition in their own markets. So there's there's really the sort of business business rationale. Sure, sure. Okay, very good. Uh, I've got another one here. Um, the fellow says, I am hoping to get some insight on the best strategy to detect HDR and SDR TV. Uh, I'm I'm not entirely clear what uh, what this fellow is asking, Mark. Uh, you you that one? Yeah, so there's a, there's a couple of different ways depending on how you deliver. If you're talking about applications on smart TVs, the TVs themselves will announce their capabilities. If you're building uh, your application into a device that may be connected via like an HDMI wire. Um, the 861 standard uh, from CEA, or CTA now, I guess it is. I guess they don't change the spec names to CTA 861, do they? Um, and the um, HDMI uh, forum has uh, provided a, a, a nice, rich communication protocol to detect the capabilities of a TV. And we use that to determine whether we should uh, offer an Ultra HD asset to the television because the TV is capable of it. And likewise with HDR. And likewise with other features of the TV, including audio codecs and video codecs and all of those. So it's there's a little finesse in getting that to work because it tends to be down at firmware layers and devices. But once you have it working, you have a very good, reliable means of detecting the capability of the device as long as it's across a digital connection. Now, if you're on channel 3, 4, or component or composite, uh, well, just the lack of having a digital handshake may suggest you go to lowest common denominator. OK, OK. Uh, now, Mark, is this typically uh, out-of-band signaling, or is this part of the transport stream? Uh, so no, the signaling that I'm speaking of is um, either application layer signaling, if you're on the uh, hosted platform, like a television set. Um, but if you're across a wire, an HDMI wire to a TV, uh, there's something called um, EDID and InfoFrame are two HDMI constructs. So they're in the HDMI protocol. When you hot plug a TV, it announces itself. Um, and over the past few years, those announcements have gotten much more reliable and verbose, so you can tell quite a bit more. It's more important now because we're not just talking about is it an HDTV, is it an HDTV, is it an HDR TV, is it an Ultra HD TV? Okay. Okay. So can I add to that, Ron? I, because uh, I'd guide your, your um, viewer to SIMTI. We've done a lot of work in this space. SIMTI 2084 specifically, and the section is section eight of that document that talks about the role of metadata and signaling for mixed HDR, SDR environments. It's a it's a good document, well thought through. 52 pages long, so it's uh, it's good airplane reading, or if you have a problem falling asleep, you can uh, take it with you. Okay. Okay. Very good. All right. Let's see. What uh, what else have we? Um, this is a little bit of a uh, the, a little bit of a generalist question. Um, fellow says, I've heard that this is the breakout year for true UHD. Is that true? Um, I think David, this might best be a question for you. Yeah, I'm happy to field that. I think it's definitely the breakout tire-kicking year for um, UHD. I think uh, 2017 and beyond is when it really starts to gather momentum, when there is a sufficient installed base of UHD, Ultra HD premium screens, 
and a consensus is reached around those eight um, issues that we talked about. Yeah. Um, it's going to take a little while, take the rest of this year to sort through all that in some you know, really good way. So 2017, that's where I'm warning my wife, I need to go down to Best Buy, so it's probably about mid-year. <laughs> Okay, very good. I may be, for, I may be forced to uh, to be ahead of you in that line, David. So. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's see. Steve, I think this one is probably best uh, directed to you. Uh, what's the difference between security for Ultra HD video and regular video? I don't know. Okay, well, that, that, that could take uh, the rest of the hour. <laughs> um, <laughs> You know, the, 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 the founding principle here is uh, to protect services of, of higher value. But as I mentioned uh, previously in, in the discussion, uh, the essence of some of the things that are being talked about as part of UHD security is the renewability, the ability to stay one step ahead of the, uh, the curve in terms of the threats that are being presented and the... Uh, the, the the, the weak link in the chain in, in, the, uh, in the system. So um, if, we, if we pay attention to those kinds of things, uh, those are the kind of uh, uh, foundation elements of uh, UHD security, the ultra security regime that we've, that we've put in place for uh, our VCAS product, our premier VCAS product. Okay, okay, very good. Uh, let's see, we've got another one here, um, and this one I think I'm just going to throw out to the entire field, and you guys can uh, you know, weigh in you know, when and as uh, seems best. Uh, the fellow is asking, do you think the current maximum NIT level we're seeing, 1,000, is enough or should it be more? This sounds to me like an HDR question rather than an Ultra HD question per se, but uh, guys, have fun. This let, me, is let me go with that. So, so, so first of all, Ron, please don't confuse um, HDR as being separate from Ultra HD. It is part, an intrinsic part of Ultra HD, just like 4K, next generation audio, etc., white color, again, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, so... So the, the, thing, the question is good because um, even the DVB have said that uh, there are some issues with the current levels of, of definition of, of, um, of brightness because of ambient light. So uh, there, there, I think there is probably a role for um, adaptive, um, uh, some, some kind of intelligence in the display which senses uh, the lights, uh, ambient lights, um, and, and produces the best. They're trying to reproduce the artistic content, right? the artistic intent, and eventually maybe we'll get to a point where we can actually have the color decision list come down from the producer all the way as metadata down into the screen. And anyway, bottom line is that there is, I think, a strong possibility of two or three or 4,000 uh, nit um, displays coming as a second wave, um, but you have to remember the caveat about the power consumption because it is it is a lot, and it has to has to definitely will kind of uh, work against adoption when you realise you can't achieve some of the Energy Star compliances and things like that with uh, something as bright as that. Okay, okay, very good. Uh, Steve, Mark, any thoughts on that one? No, I, I very much agree with David, and the creatives are only just learning how to deal with this new set of tools, right? So you're basically giving somebody who had a fixed set of paintbrushes a whole other set of paintbrushes, and they've got new colors and new brightnesses, and they're going to learn to tell stories differently, uh, and we'll see that evolve over time, and I think that's going to start to figure out what directors and colorists and directors of photography are going to say, you know what, I can shoot into the sun a little bit more, or I can shoot a little bit more brightness or a lot more details. Now I can start to tell stories in the dark parts of the scenes. Um, once that happens, I, th I think that's where you'll start to see the answer to this NITS question become more clear. Yeah, I to totally agree, Mark. It's, uh, you know, it's, the, it's part of the new creative uh, environment, as you said. And uh, yeah. it's going to be... 
it's going to be very interesting and more uh, more creativity more compelling content and uh, a better consumer experience from that okay very good uh, let's see uh, I think we've got time for one more here um, uh, what are some of the lessons learned from operators that have already launched Ultra HD services. Uh, Mark, this is pretty clearly to you, but David, I think you can probably weigh in on this as well. Um, I, I guess the the uh, I guess the big thing is 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 there uh, you know, just a bullet point list where we can say, all right, here are the things you need to do. Does that make sense? To, to, let me just understand the question a little better. I want to be able to answer it correctly. So it's. The, just the, the checklist before you launch any uh, NHDR service? Uh, that's the way I would interpret it. The, what the question says is, what are some of the lessons learned? And we've, you know, we've discussed that, um, but uh, it does seem like having a little checklist of at least things to be thinking about before you start would yeah. be a useful thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, and this is where I return to groups like the Ultra HD Forum, which are really doing a good job of capturing best practices. And it's not a spec generating organization. It's one to say, listen, in order to have the best interoperability, these are the right things to do. Um, the other thing is talk to those who have experience in it. Uh, sure. And there are those who do purely internet-based delivery, uh, OTT style, as I used before, and others who are more traditional MVPDs or multi-channel video producer distributors and their methods. Uh, there's a wealth of knowledge being built up in here. I, I come back to what is the objective you're trying to reach in offering these new services and then figure out the right technologies and methods to go and achieve those objectives. Okay. I would agree and um, I'd say that we're all learning um, in different ways, depending on the different permutations, is you know, for, for obviously for canned content, the learning curve is far far greater um, down the line. Um, but for we're we're starting to learn more about broadcast now. Um, there's there's lessons learned. That's why we've uh, got this uh, you know, 51 p 51 uh, entities in the Ultra HD forum now, and and it took us four months to work through. To define guidelines for just the next 12 months, so it's it is a lot of conflicting and and sometimes you just have to get the optimal um, solution set, and that's what we try to define in these guidelines. And then we're moving on to phase B, which is for 2017 and beyond. But it's we're all learning all over the entire industry and the entire de uh, delivery chain. Okay, very good. Um, I want to try and sneak in one last quick question. Um, fella is asking, do we think mobile, tablet, and laptops will support HDR, and if so, when? Well, they already do. Um, there is HDR. By the way, HDR is not a new technology. It's actually been around in, uh, in just photographs since the Victorian days. Um, huh? So, so if you look at your phone, you, the chances are very high that you've got an HDR mode for capturing video and, and uh, photographs in that. The uh, um, question is, um, is it going to be part of tablets and, and phones and, and for the viewing experience, will there be a sufficient brightness in the, in the screen to be able to make a difference? I think that's the end goal. I think, um, I think we'll see that happen. and. Uh, it will produce a, a richer environment. So you'll see everybody running for the darkest part of the room to watch their <laughs> HDR on their iPad. Right. <laughs> and uh, their, battery, their batteries will drain that much more fast, right? So that much faster, right? So. Yeah. Yes, indeedy. OK, guys, we are at uh, 59 minutes, uh, so we should probably start wrapping up. We're basically out of time. Uh, once again, guys, uh, thank you all very much for coming. Um, uh, to you, to you, audience members as well. Thank you. Um, our uh, distinguished panel again: David Price from the Ultra HD Forum, Mark Francisco from Comcast, and Steve Christian from Verimatrix. And of course, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Verimatrix, once again. Um, within uh, about the next 15 minutes or so. 
This Hangout will be available for on-demand viewing at uh, the same link that you use to get here for the live event. Um, again, everybody, thanks very much for watching, and have a good day. Thanks, Ron. Thank you.